Well, greetings and thank you for the Song of Zazen. Um, I want to just begin with a moment of acknowledgement for our wonderful abbot Jumpo, Dennis Kelly. And because today I want to talk a little bit about our lineage and the pot some of the potentials that uh, are present here for us in our practice. So with great love and blessings to Jumpo um, and all the gifts that he has given everyone that is uh, connected here. Also want to thank uh, Vice Abbot Taiso for being present today and uh, as well as uh, Roshi Fujin, my dear brother, who is actually my senpai in Hollow Bones. He was already here when I started in uh, 2000, I think 2001, something right in there. So we have a wonderful team today with uh, Bodhi and Betsy and Ekai, who is so beautifully and skillfully being our Eno, uh, and our, our, uh, our new guru, <laughs> our, our tech guru, Estudo. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here and uh, supporting all of us in the, in the practice. The, the practice of Zen in this way uh, is it really, every time I, I hear us doing the practices uh, chanting the Heart Sutra and so on really uh, connects me with the sacredness of practice and the container that is potential in our coming together as a, as a Sangha. And of course now we're doing that virtually, but in deep heart mind there is no space, there is no time, and so we're very much together. Uh, and that's something that I, I so uh, deeply appreciate. Uh, Bodhi just did a beautiful job of uh, working with the Qigong, expressing the principles and uh, some unique practices. Uh, of course, from White Crane, there are many, many. Uh, let me begin by connecting us with the lineage of our practice today. As I want to talk with you a little bit about these twin rivers of, of Zen and Qigong and kind of bring us back to some roots here and why we even do these kinds of embodiment practices to, to begin with. Now, it's been my experience uh, over the years that a Dharma talk in some ways, has some characteristics that are interesting for us to note. So, in one way, a Dharma talk can inform us, can, you know, on the, on the kind of the level of understanding and cognition and, and so on, it brings information. So we can bring information, and often that information is very liberating to, uh, to connect with, like the, like the, uh, the Four Noble Truths and the, the aspects of the three characteristics of, you know, impermanence and non-self and the nature of uh, suffering, the nature of human life. So just to understand those things and to speak about them, to talk about them in the ways that we sometimes do, is, is very liberating. Uh, and, uh, and uh, joyful to connect with. Uh, another aspect that, that we hope we connect with in our, uh, in our Dharma talk and in our time together, in our practice together, is inspiration. And inspiration helps us to uh, both persevere and have patience with our practice, which is absolutely essential. Because we know that uh, a course of practice and realization and actualization and embodiment is not just a, a gradient that goes up all the time, is it? So um, we, we notice that there are natural oscillations, of course, and there are often also plateaus that we connect with from time to time where, 
you've been practicing for a while, you've been practicing your, your Zen or your meditation or your Qigong, and nothing on the level of appearance seems to be happening. Those are called plateaus. And plateaus are, uh, are important times to connect with your commitment to your practice. Yeah, it's the commitment inside uh, our practice that helps us to persevere through the, even the downflows of the natural oscillations of, of learning and development. But also on those plateaus where nothing appears to be happening. But yes, things are happening in uh, the plateaus. You, we are more deeply integrating. And that's due to uh, the, our connection with our commitment to the practice, to our commitment to awakening. Another important aspect of that that will make three aspects here that I want to begin with is uh, is transmission, and transmission. What is the transmission of dharma after all? So, it's not a top-down connection. It is as we connect with our lineage. It is our coming together. Our sisterhood, our brotherhood, our camaraderie, our sangha in connection with the beauty and the truth of Dharma. These are the teachings that have come through Siddhartha Gautama, but also they are present in other traditions and the beautiful tradition of, of Taoist practices, the teachings of Lao Tzu, are also a kind of Dharma. In the, in the great and beautiful practices of the First Nation peoples here in the United States, they had a beautiful dharma of connecting with the Great Spirit. And uh, that is longer even, so it is said, than, than the other uh, cultures that I will often refer to or we, we reference, like the Japanese tradition of the Renzai, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, and the previous and the supporting uh, uh, foundational institutions, you could say, of Lin Chi and before that of Bodhidharma. So transmission is us connecting with what is most essential, with what is most dear to us in this in both the process and development and the unfoldment of awakening. So as we connect that deep heart listening that you have is not just respect for the teacher, is respect for the Dharma itself. So when you listen in and listen for the, the core seeds and the, the deeper feeling of the connection to our lineage, this is such a beautiful and powerful thing to connect with. I connect it with this in our Zen lineage now through uh, Junpo and Edo Roshi and all the various committed uh, teachers that have been part of that lineage tradition. So on, you know, on Shashin, we do the lineage chant often at night and recognizing the, uh, the succession of teachers. But the, the transmission that I'm talking about is not just about uh, the teachers, it's about the teachings. And the, the, the teachers can sometimes be a portal or a lens into the teachings to see it, hopefully sometimes in fresh ways or in ways that are especially meaningful or valuable to us. Um, for the awakening perspective, the awakening perspective in our realization and our actual actualization of uh, understanding the, the core value, <laughs> really, of the Dharma itself. So, our particular lineage, known as the Zen lineage, um, I know that many of you are aware of this, but I want to connect with a particular part of this lineage today. 
Uh, and that goes back to Bodhidharma, who was uh, an Indian Brahmin um, who made his way uh, from India to China. Now, probably you already know that, uh, that Buddhism from, from the period of the axial, what's called the axial period, in which uh, the, our, our Siddhartha Gautam uh, uh, and uh, the Buddha, <laughs> and also, uh, you know, Lao Tzu and other teachers, in, including Confucius, and there are, there are others, it was a very rich period. Um, so that was about approximately 600 BCE, before current era, yes. Um, so the Dharma moved from India, it is known or, or it's uh, thought to be about uh, 200, maybe two to 300 years later. That's when the teachings started to move into China and other parts of the Himalayas and Afghanistan and so on, where there are other rich traditions of, of contemplative and non-dual practice, right? The Bon tradition. It wasn't until much later that the, that the Tibetans actually uh, connected with uh, Buddhism and the tantric practices that uh, were part of that uh, lineage. Nevertheless, through the Silk Road and so on, uh, Buddhism started to come into China, and it met with uh, great welcome uh, and open arms and had a beautiful confluence with the long-lived Taoist practices and traditions that was um, thriving in China at that time. So the, the practices of, of Taoism being in harmony with the Tao, with the way things are, is very similar in some ways and uniquely different from Buddhist practice, from Buddhist understanding, from Buddhist, uh, you could say, theory or philosophy. From our point of view, we're looking at it as embodied knowing, and this is quite uh, an important aspect of our, of our understanding and of our lineage. So it wasn't until, oh, maybe uh, four or five uh, hundred CE, and we don't know the exact time. There's a lot of speculation and lots of arguments among scholars about when Bodhidharma might have actually been there, or was he even real? Or <laughs> we, we of course, uh, think that he was, and uh, the exact time that he landed in China is not so much the issue, but what he brought, I think, is the issue. So I want to talk just a, for a moment about that with you, and uh, because it's it's the really the foundation of our lineage. When Bodhidharma came to China, he was already meeting with then several hundred years of development and confluence with the. Uh, with the Taoist traditions, um, uh, the, the leaders and the, the emperors and the empresses, they definitely um, saw, or many of them did, saw the value of it and supported monasteries and supported monks and practices and built temples and shrines and, and all of that sort of thing. So the story, as you may well know, but I'm going to tell it again just because it's, it's really worthwhile. So Bodhidharma comes from India after, I'm sure, a long uh, trek and um, comes to uh, meet with Emperor Wu of Liang. And uh, Emperor Wu of Liang has been doing these great things, has been building shrines and monasteries and supporting monks and practices and everything else like that. So, okay, here's this, uh, here's this red-haired, blue-eyed upstart from, from um, India. At least that's, the, that's part of the lore. And that's not unusual, by the way. You should know that, that those traditions of Buddhist practice uh, reference sometimes uh, 
people th that weren't only of the uh, were were may maybe of some Aryan source in there. So we don't know. There there may be some anthropologists that are more uh, fluid on that, but there are some archaeological evidence in that uh, way. That's not the important thing. The important thing that was that Bodhidharma was uh, a sincere practitioner. It is said that he was the son of a of a king, and that he was a, uh, a well-respected Brahmin, maybe even of the warrior class. The, these are elements of the lore. But when, when uh, Emperor Wu called him, uh, Emperor Wu had some questions for this guy. So Bodhidharma is there, and uh, Emperor Wu says this. says, of course, this is a translation. <laughs> How much karmic merit have I earned for or ordaining Buddhist monks, building monasteries, had, having sutras copied, and commissioning Buddhist images? So here's the here's the Bodhidharma in the court of Emperor Lu, uh, and uh, Wu, and he is, um, you know, asked to answer this question. And what's he going to say? Oh, yeah, you've got great merit. Oh, you're definitely going to Buddhist heaven. And no, he doesn't say that. He says, Bodhidharma, just in the way of our kind of our Zen tradition, says, none. Good deeds done with worldly intent bring good karma, but no merit. Wow. So our emperor says, so what is the highest meaning of noble truth? So he's kind of digging down into Bodhidharma here a little bit. And Bodhidharma says, there is no noble truth. <laughs> there is only emptiness. <laughs> well, uh, that put Emperor Wu back on his heels. Hey, what do you mean there's no noble truth? What about the noble truths and da-da-da? So Emperor Wu says, then, who is standing before me? And Bodhidharma says, I know not, your majesty. So, wow, with that orientation, all the Emperor Wu is thinking he's going to have all this merit connected to, to uh, his good deeds. And Bodhidharma says, you get good, you got good karma, dude, but you... Um, you know, don't think that that's your gateway to heaven or, or to realization. And there is no, you know, what is the greatest, what is the greatest truth? There is only emptiness. Well, this didn't apparently land all that well with Emperor Wu, who didn't quite, uh, you know, get it at the time. He had been doing great deeds. So what Bodhidharma does from there is he goes to the local, one of the monasteries where they are doing translations of texts, uh, Buddhist texts into Chinese and so on. This is an important aspect. There is a, there's a number of stories and lore about how long Bodhidharma sat in a cave and listened to ants crawl up the wall and and drilled a hole in the, in the rock with his gaze. Uh, a, a number of wonderful lore stories and so on. But the point that I want to bring out today is this. After a certain amount of time, with Bodhidharma uh, being in contemplative relationship here and then being here at the Shaolin Temple. By the way, the Shaolin Temple, long before Kung Fu, was, uh, I think, said to be a translation, a place of translation. This is one of the stories that we have. So what he noticed amongst the life of the um, translators of them, I assume it was all monks at that time because the, the monasteries and the nunneries uh, tended to be separated, um, was the very poor health of the of the translators and of the of the monks there, because they um, 
they had no vitality. So when they went to meditate, it was like falling out. Uh, they had no strength. They had no internal strength. They had, they're really wasting or misusing their chi. So it is said that the Bo that Bodhidharma then uh, brought forward um, a set of texts, two primary texts. One is called the Ijin Jing, and one is called the Shi Shui Jing. Now the Ijin Jing is Sometimes the, the Jing part of it is a book, uh, it was a classic, um, and it contained the principles for enlivening practice. It's sometimes called the bone, uh, no, sometimes called the uh, tendon changing or the tendon and muscle changing or strengthening classic. And it was not about a set of practices they may have done practices, likely did. In modern iterations, the Ijin Jing is said to be a set of practices, which may or may not be true, uh, because when you look at the lineage of the Qigong, they're represented differently, but the core of them is these essential uh, principles. Now, I won't go all through those right now, but it's very interesting to know that and that the strengthening that takes place through the application of the principles with the technique, really blending this beautiful practice of mindfulness. Yeah, embodied presence with these principles tends to enliven, tends to clarify, tends to liberate and actually strengthen the the, the fabric of our human bodies. Nowadays, we also know that these kinds of practices that we do, the, the Qigong, the Taoyin, the Negong practices, and I'll say more about those in a moment, the ones that we're doing today, the ones that Bodhi led you in, uh, the ones that Betsy will lead you in this afternoon, and the ones that I did this morning and will continue to do this afternoon. These are practices that build strength and tone, not only of the fabric of the muscles and tendons, which is very important, but of the brain and nervous system. And this is an aspect of our practice that is often overlooked. Often practitioners come to Zen or come to Vipassana meditation, or Vajrayana, and they just kind of, okay, sit down and shut up. But th that can be a very useful practice, but it also can be immensely confusing and people can, can spend years in inner confusion around uh, without, without some good guidance and also without the enlivening nature. Now, I know that uh, Jumpo, and I've talked about this many, many times, and um, he said, yeah, that's Zen disease. Zen disease is, uh, is too much meditation. But it might not just be too much meditation. It might be not enough skillful meditation with the embodied principles of, of learning how to breathe, uh, learning how to strengthen that, uh, the tensile system of our tendons and ligaments, but also in muscles, myofascial plane, but also that strength of the nervous system. And that toning that takes place has a number of important values for us. And they are certainly amongst the ones that I want to speak about are those of being able to what we call concentrate. So just to come into meditation and try to start to, uh, to meditate, you all know, and I know this is so, we all have experienced this like, no, I, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> I can't do this because my mind is all over the place. Of course it is. This is the, when we come into the orientation of, of um, Kensho, of our, of our practice of meditation, Zazen, this, this practice is fundamentally transforming our neurobiology. 
right? It's changing things from the inside out. And, and for the cognitive mind at first, it, it has no idea what's going on. But gradually through the stillness and then through the skill of embodiment, of that moving and the pulsing, the strength of the body, the strength of the mind, the resolve of the heart, and the ability to learn how to focus, which our wonderful Vice Abbot recently did uh, a beautiful teaching on Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. And these, are again, from the Indian tradition, those are Indian words that reference the ability to focus, the ability to meditate, and then the ability to abs be absorbed in the realization of this uh, aspect. So Bodhidharma brought the, uh, the Ijin Jing and the principles of the slow and smooth practices for right from the beginning, the extension, the opening, and the frames of the practice that are later uh, embraced by Tai Chi Chuan. And certainly for us in our Qigong, we do these practices smoothly, slowly, with some sense of quietness internally and externally. And this is changing our biochemistry. It is changing our neurobiology. So these things take time. And, uh, and being with it in such a way that we are patient with these practices is an important aspect. Our culture, as you all well know, is uh, the kind of that McDonald's culture. And if I come to sit at a, a shishin one time, will I be enlightened? Well, it's like Master uh, Hakuin saying, just one, just one time of meditation, you'll see all your twisted karma erased. How about that? Does that mean we've never, <laughs> we've never meditated? Or maybe never meditated right? Uh, no. When you are in that practice, in the absorption of, the, of, samadhi, of samadhi, your twisted karma is erased. But we are in these living human beings. And because of that, the flow and the history, our, our personal karma, our collective karma, all the various karmas are here and expressed. So we continue and we begin the unwinding. So the unwinding is a neurobiological neurobiolo unwinding. It is a cognitive unwinding. And one of the beauties that we have in our modern times is it's not just about awakening. But I think those of us that study uh, integral uh, theory understand that, that awakening needs to be joined with growing up. And that is the maturing and the, uh, yeah, the the maturing of our psychological and emotional natures. One of the real beautiful things that Junpo and those of us that have been with him from the beginning have developed through Mondo Zen is understanding and bringing the Zen and the koan practice into the emotional domains, into the psychological domains as well. So our awakening is not just about Kensho, and Ken Kensho is absolutely essential. That is recognizing our true nature. This is absolutely essential. This is why we do our practices, why we have our ritual, why we stay in sometimes discomfort for a while, is to uh, allow this the seed of the heart to open to realization of who we are that we are, in fact, all of life, right now, have always been, will be, and yet we have this uniqueness of our human expression. A little bit later on, sometime after uh, 
Bodhidharma. Uh, the founder of our particular lineage is Lin Chi Yichuan. When I was in China, teaching in China, um, a couple of years ago, before the COVID uh, took place, I had beautiful opportunity. My hosts took me to the monastery to meet the abbot and to see the original home of Lin Chi Ichuan, the founder of what we, from the Japanese point of view, call the Renzai tradition. And it uh, was beautiful, as you can imagine, pristinely uh, kept. There were probably only really maybe 30 or 40 resident monks. There was a whole community of uh, lay people around that supported the, the temple and the town. It was, uh, it was a, a beautiful time and the, the, the abbot was uh, quite generous. And, uh, but <laughs> I have to say, you know, they were doing their practices and their chanting exactly as they did it, you know, in, uh, in uh, 800 CE. So, um, which is good, it kind of keeps a, a certain flavor, but there was no sense, you know, I, um, I couldn't say, well, what about neurobiology to, to the abbot there, because it probably wouldn't have been a welcome comment. But nevertheless, we understand that that was the, uh, that was the beginning. The record of Lin Chi and the, and the koan process really wasn't written down for a couple hundred years. So what we have is just stories about Lin Chi. And then later on, maybe in the 11th century or so, the traditions of what we call Soto Zen and also Renzai Zen from the Japanese, in the Japanese word, which was Lin Chi Ichuan's tradition of Chan became Zen in Japan. And so our particular lineage, that's when we chant the lineages, we chant the lineages of the, of the Indian teachers in their succession. And then the Chanji, the, uh, uh, the Chinese tr uh, teachers, and then the uh, Japanese teachers. And now with the uh, courage and the bravery of Junpo, uh, we now have an American tradition that is in the lineage of all these wonderful uh, practices and the transmission of that Dharma essentially going forward. Remember that connection with our lineage. One of the things that kind of got left um, when the transference of, uh, of Chan to Zen in, um, in the uh, Japanese tradition was the embodiment practices that have always been part of, uh, of the Chan tradition. Later on, it opened into uh, the Shaolin Monastery with the Kung Fu. That's a whole other story, which I won't get into, which I'd love to tell you about sometime. And, uh, but our practices of the integration of, uh, of our Qigong with the Dharma is absolutely essential, especially in the evolutionary wave that we're representing now in uh, hollow bones and in the evolution of, of Zen as it comes to America. And there's a number of beautiful flowerings, including some of the amazing principles of integral understanding. And that's that part where we work with the emotional koans in Armando Zen as well. Well, 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 I could go on and on here. And, uh, um, but those are the essential things that I wanted to represent today in this talk to talk about the unwinding which is also the kind of letting go of the habitual patterns. So we use, we use Zen, we use Mondo, we use our Qigong to help to unwind the signatures of neurological and 
habitual and familial patterns within our bodies, not to get rid of, because forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. We are, in fact, you know, finding the harmony of coming, coming home to who we are in this essential Renzai practice of Kensho, recognizing who we are, but also in uh, this growing up, this beautiful aspect. So my dear sisters and brothers, what a delight to be here with you today and have these few moments to, uh, to share some uh, Dharma with you, uh, my connection with this beautiful lineage of hollow bones and, uh, and our wonderful teacher, Junpo Dennis Kelly. Uh, may you be well, Junpo. So with that, uh, blessings and look forward to being with you here throughout the day. Roshi, Fudo Mio, may I take a couple minutes here? Please do, thank you. This is Taiso Hanya. So Teja, Teja Fudomio has so uh, kindly said, uh, Vice Abbot. And I'm here really uh, on behalf of Junpo, who can't be here today. I want to thank you for bringing this teaching to our Sangha and for the privilege personally to practice with you, which I'll say something about. And we could say how grateful we are that you take your seat, that you took your seat a long time ago. But what a gift it is to us in the Sangha to be able to practice here with you today. And uh, I am personally uh, appreciate being able to join in for several sessions. One of the things I like to point out, I don't know whether you remember this, we don't know. On this mala, that is the mala of hollow bones that I carry, is a disc brass or bronze disc, I think it's probably bronze, uh, that you gave me about 15 years ago. So it's at the base of my mala. And above it a little while, I think it's so wonderful that you brought the teaching of, uh, of uh, Bodhidharma. Uh, my, my own Dharma name, uh, Taiso, is uh, the posthumous name of Hui Ke, Bodhidharma student. And I carry a little shard uh, from the mountain below that cave above the Shaolin Su. <laughs> so, what a delightful uh, presentation of the teaching. And the connection that we've had, uh, as uh, you may remember, I'm a Taiji practitioner. So, to discover you in this lineage and to get to practice with you, what a privilege and how grateful we are that you bring this teaching to our brothers and sisters in the Sangha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Taiso. Thank you, Tija. Kinhin. <laughs>